there's a lot of imaging data in hospitals. And if we wanted to get um, use out of any of it for diagnosis or surveillance or um, kind of prediction of various issues, uh, usually early detection is key uh, in having a good prognosis. And um, so some of the kinds of uh, scans that we see are x-rays, CT, scan, oh, CT scans, uh, MRIs, ultrasounds, and microscope images, to name a few. And being able to learn how to detect certain diseases from these images can hopefully help uh, clinicians by facilitating their job in finding any kind of anomaly. Uh, and uh, this is where deep learning kind of comes in. And um, so AI, at least the kind of AI that we are talking about is an umbrella term for a program that is trained to solve a certain task really well. Um, so a subset of AI is ML, which automatically learns um, from a large data set uh, without being explicitly programmed. And uh, a subset of ML is deep learning, which is inspired by the way the brain processes information using what are called neural networks. And uh, biological neurons uh, take signals from uh, some neurons and then pass them on to other neurons. And this is similar to the way in which artificial neurons within uh, neural networks uh, kind of process the information um, and are structured as well. And a convolutional neural network uh, is a type of artificial neural network that is usually used to analyze visual imagery. So if we start off with a randomly initialized network, as we see more and more data, more and more input data, um, the neural network, uh, we want to train it uh, so that the neurons are updated throughout the training so that for a given image, the neural network predicts the correct label. Um, so within this realm, uh, there is supervised and unsupervised learning. So is the data labeled? If it is, uh, we can use supervised learning. If it's not, then we can use some kind of clustering uh, methods to see if there are any interesting patterns within the data. Um, if we're looking at a mixture of both labeled and unlabeled data, we could look at um, semi-supervised learning, which is kind of a combination of both of them. And then uh, there are generative models versus discriminative models. So generative models try to learn the distributions uh, of the data and discriminative models try to get the boundaries between those distributions. And um, if we have classification problems uh, versus uh, kind of regression problems, we try to look at whether we want to predict a label or a quantity. And if we're looking at uh, segmentation, we're trying to partition uh, similar pixels into certain groups and other pixels into other groups. Um, and if we're looking at anomaly detection, usually, and this is uh, the case for healthcare, we have a lot of data that there's really nothing um, anomalous about. Um, so if there's some way of finding uh, anomalies without having to train, you know, if only 1% of data had um, some kind of anomaly, it will be very in, uh, imbalanced, uh, the training. So uh, anomaly detection can be used in that sense to kind of uh, learn the healthy uh, or the non-anomalous uh, distribution so that we can find the anomalous distribution later on. Um, and then uh, binary classification versus multi-class classification. Uh, and multi-label usually has to do with uh, if I have an image and I want to predict multiple things in it um, uh, that aren't mutually exclusive, uh, that will be multi-label classification. And I'll show you some examples uh, soon. So one of the projects, or the first project I actually worked on uh, was the creation of synthetic x-rays to train a neural network to detect cancer. Uh, and the idea was that since we didn't have enough x-ray data to predict lung cancer effectively, especially when it was very early and very small, the nodules were very small, uh, we wanted to use CT scans, which were also x-ray based and are filled uh, 3D volume pixels or voxels uh, with radio density information so that we can generate more data. So using Beer's law, uh, which um, tells us basically how much light is left after it passes through an object, um, we can use CT scans to generate x-rays uh, using this um, method right here. And um, 
But the issue was we didn't have enough tumor or nodule information either uh, because we didn't have that much data. So what we did was we tried to generate uh, synthetic nodules uh, as well and place them within the lungs uh, at different parts um, to um, simulate um, cancers. And uh, because the lung voxels have lower radio density uh, than the other parts of the chest CT, we're able to identify them using the threshold, and this is how they looked, and then synthetically generate a nodule by growing several 3D blobs and then choosing a radio density for them uh, within a probable range, and then randomly placing it within those voxels. And uh, this is an example of a synthetic nodule um, inserted into a synthetic x-ray. So if you noticed, it is right here. That's the synthetic nodule. And um, basically, we tried to train our neural network uh, in this method. And turns out that because the um, amount of CT scans we had wasn't that large and the amount of um, uh, like nodule locations we picked, uh, first of all, they were very small. Uh, so the signal to noise ratio wasn't very great. So to increase it, we basically looked at patches. Uh, so we tried to take many patches around the x-ray and try to in insert them at specifically those patches and then use kind of a window, sliding window approach to train um, our neural network. And um, this was the result from a synthetic nodule on a synthetic x-ray. So we placed it right there and it did a pretty good job of identifying it right here. Um, and this was a real x-ray, a real nodule. And as you can see, there's a lot more false positives um, uh, around the bone area, especially, uh, but it also identifies the nodule here. And my other project uh, that I've been working on, uh, I'm also working on currently, is early pediatric cancer detection in whole body MRIs. And basically, when a baby's born uh, and they're diagnosed with uh, cancer predisposition syndrome, um, there's a cancer surveillance protocol, which includes uh, an annual whole body MRI. And if a cancer is noted in that MRI, then a biopsy takes place and aggressive chemotherapy is given. Um, and to avoid those last two steps there, um, ML is used in this spot here. So we can make this early, then it makes it a little bit easier uh, for everyone. And uh, so what we did was we tried to train it uh, by using pre-processed MRI images and use generative models only on the healthy images so that we can learn the healthy distribution. And during testing, uh, we tested on images with and without lesions. So when we used this healthy generative model uh, and reconstructed it, um, we were able to note that the anomalies weren't transferred over. Uh, so when we used the residual as a mask, and then combined all the body parts, we were able to get kind of a, an idea of where the anomalies could be. And um, so for example, if we had this slice, then uh, our anomalies right here. So if we just split it into pieces and passed it into the, um, our generative model, uh, the healthy generative model, uh, it would hopefully leave out this part here, which is the anomaly, which it does. And when we stitch it back together and then subtract we should get kind of a, a mask um, of where the anomaly should be. And uh, some of the other projects I've worked on include um, cervical spine fracture detection in CT scans. Um, so like trying to find broken uh, spines. And uh, another one is human protein classification microscope images. So trying to find, in this case, trying to find uh, what organelles the green um, kind of parts in these images represent. Uh, and this would be a multi-label classification pro problem because many, um, uh, many organelles could be within those green uh, sections of the image, um, up to 28. And this was for a course project. And then uh, view and outcome prediction from pediatric renal ultrasounds. Also, I'd say kids uh, trying to predict uh, which view uh, an ultrasound was taken in. So, uh, sagittal versus transverse, left versus right kidney or bladder or some kind of other uh, view. And um, also try to predict whether this person had reflux or um, needed surgery or had uh, poor kidney function uh, just by looking at the ultrasounds. 
And then this was my master's project actually. So I worked on automatic facial pain detection in older adults with dementia using these specific muscles uh, and uh, getting a pain score out of that, um, trying to automatically alert uh, hopefully staff uh, who can then change care or treatment based on uh, pain assessment. And future directions through my PhD, I'm trying to look at federated learning, which basically um, allows for the training of models at various entities uh, without having to share the data and then combining them into a hopefully superior global model. And then fairness and debiasing so that we um, remove any biases with respect to age or gender or uh, race uh, and such. And then of course, privacy preserving mechanisms. And then finally just studying the efficacy of these tools in a clinical setting uh, to see if they're um, robust. And um, that's pretty much it from me. Uh, if anyone has any questions, thank you again uh, for your time today.